It's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Felix Feng, um, uh, who uh, many of you know is one of our stellar radiation oncologists. Um, what people may not know uh, in this audience is that he's actually one of the leading um, uh, uh, computational biology, cancer genetics, prostate cancer genetics experts in the country, um, both in early stage and late stage disease. So we've asked P um, Felix to speak at a very basic level about um, genetics. So it's not going to be a lot of detail. It's going to be the ABCs, and then you'll hear more about it throughout the day. Dr. Frank. Great. I'd like to begin by uh, thanking Eric and Stan and Merrill for uh, asking me to talk. Um, today, as Eric mentioned, I'll talk about prostate cancer genetics, and I'll expand a little bit upon, about um, germline screening, which is what Peter touched upon briefly. Um, and Eric asked me to talk about biology, but I, 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 if I spoke about biology for 15 minutes, I, I might bore some of you. So I'm going to try to keep this in the context of uh, clinically relevant situations. And so I want to begin with an overview of genetics, <clears throat> and that is, you know, within a cell, how are biological processes implemented? And so it turns out that we, each of our cells has a genetic code in it. It's called DNA, shown here in the blue. And the DNA can be considered a database of information. That DNA is then made into something called RNA. It's called transcri it's transcribed into RNA. And out of this database, the specific pieces of RNA provide a little bit more specific instructions on different things that can happen. This RNA is made into proteins, and proteins usually are the effectors uh, of the biology within our cells. And so you start with DNA, you move to RNA, it gets made into protein. Now that's, all, that's what happens in normal cells. The next question that I want to answer is, what are some of the genomic or genetic alterations that can occur in cancer? And so many of you have heard about this word mutation. So a mutation basically is a change in DNA uh, that can lead to something uh, bad downstream. And so DNA basically is comprised of a double helix, as you see here. And this double helix is, includes what we call nucleotides. Um, and those are the components of the DNA. The nucleotides actually can uh, get mutated or changed to another nucleotide. So here you see this orange nucleotide, and that's basically a mutation. And instead of a normal protein eventually being made, this uh, mutation results in an abnormal protein or sometimes no protein. And so that's sometimes how cancer uh, occurs. Another way that cancer occurs is, uh, is, is having too much of a particular type of RNA or too much of a particular type of protein. Um, and this is, there are many, many other ways, but this is some of the, the basic examples. And so another question to think about is how are patient and tumor genetic features useful in the management of prostate cancer? And so one thing we can think about is genetic testing uh, of, of patients or people who may be at risk for developing prostate cancers and other cancers. And this is kind of the concept of uh, screening for hereditary predispositions, and this is what I'm going to talk about uh, during this session. However, there's many other aspects in which gen genomics or genetics can be incorporated into uh, treatment. And so there's genomic testing of localized prostate cancers to determine non-aggressive versus aggressive disease. And Dr. Cooperberg, Dr. Nguyen, myself, Dr. Carroll will be talking about that in sessions seven and eight today. And then in the context of metastatic disease, we can use genetic testing of tumors to select uh, specific drugs for patients. And uh, Dr. Agarwal and Dr. Small will be talking about that in later sessions as well. And so first, uh, genetic testing for, for risk of prostate cancer. So in order to do this, and this is a complicated slide, I'm going to walk you through this, I have to briefly define the difference between a germline versus a somatic mutation. And so a germline mutation is what you see on the left. And this schema basically indicates what happens when you get a sperm here and an egg that combine to form an embryo that results in a person that, that then makes a um, sperm, in this case, uh, for reproduction. And so it, it, people can, or I, I, let me rephrase this, there can be mutations that arise very early in the course uh, of what we call embryogenesis, or making of an embryo. And if it occurs early enough, so the mutation here is shown in yellow, then what happens is every cell in an embryo uh, ends up with this particular mutation. Every cell in a patient ends up with this mutation. 
and uh, um, in, the, in, in the context of sperm and reproduction, half of the sperm carry this particular mutation. And you can say, why is it half? It's half because uh, uh, each of our uh, genes has two copies um, uh, in every cell, and so the mutation will affect one copy, um, and so when you make sperm, the sperm only have one of the two copies. So that's a germline mutation. That's a hereditable uh, uh, um, alteration. You can also have somatic mutations, which are non-hereditable uh, and are tumor specific. And so these are mutations that occur later after an embryo has formed and only affect some cells within the person, shown here in green. Um, and because they don't affect the reproductive cells, the sperm are normal and nothing is passed on uh, to the child. And so germline, hereditable, somatic, non-hereditable. Now there are, so, so when we think about mutations, uh, one of the most er common areas we think about are these set of genes called DNA repair genes. And these genes function to help us repair breaks in our DNA. And every day, you know, when we walk along, if we get too much sunshine, we actually get a little bit of DNA breaks in our cells, and then we have normal genes that function to repair them. When you get mutation of these genes, um, you know, our bodies aren't able to repair the stress as much, and this can lead to cancer. And so I want to show uh, an a, a example of what happens in the context of a mutation that can be passed on. So here you have a, a mother who has two copies of a, 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 two normal copies of a gene. Here you have a father who has one uh, mutation uh, in a gene and one normal copy. And so the normal copy is shown here in blue, the mutation is shown in red. There are multiple possible combinations. So just because this father has a germline mutation that can be passed on, it doesn't mean it will be passed on. And so the, uh, you know, when the, when um, in the context of the children uh, from this pair, what can happen is that the children can have two normal copies shown in blue um, uh, and, and not have any mutation initially, but let's say in this, in this top case, uh, the first child could pick up a mutation, giving uh, him, or him one bad copy, uh, and then can pick up a second mutation resulting in two bad copies that can then lead to a cancer. However, that same child may never pick up mutations and may be completely fine. Now, another situation is where the child inherits the mutation from the father and one good copy from the mother. So the, this particular patient basically has, starts off with one good copy, one mutated copy, and then over the course of his lifetime picks up a second mutation and therefore ends up with the cancer. That's a germline mutation with a second somatic mutation added on. Or this, this person could start off with a germline mutation and never pick up the second mutation and therefore never develop the cancer. And so I think this is complex, but the point is that there are mutations that can be inherited. There can be mutations that can be acquired during the course of one's life. At the end of the day, in terms of these DNA repair genes like the BRCA gene, you need two, uh, two non-functional copies in order to de develop cancer. And so it turns out that one out of 10 men, about, uh, it's actually about 12%, but one out of every 10 men with metastatic prostate cancer actually have a germline DNA repair mutation. Um, and that basically means 10% of metastatic prostate cancer has put a, a possible hereditary component to it. And that's not a small number, actually. Um, and this can represent uh, genes like BRCA2 and BRCA1. Actually, here's a spectrum of all the different germline mutations that can be uh, uh, associated with um, uh, developing cancers. BRCA2 in the context of prostate cancer is the most common one. But just also remember that not all men with these germline mutations actually have a family history of cancer, but we do need to be very, very careful when we screen the family history. And so when we take a family history from a patient, what we're looking for is the who, what, when, and how. Who, we wanna look at the, you know, uh, whether siblings, mothers, fathers, second degree relatives, whether they had any cancer, not just prostate cancer, but any cancer. We wanna know what type of cancers they had. We wanna know when they had the cancers. So therefore, you know, when, when people develop cancers at younger ages, younger, let's say less than 40, we start thinking about potentially a, more of a genetic component than if they develop cancers at 70. Um, and all, uh, how, you know, in terms of how, uh, how aggressive or non-aggressive was the particular cancer they developed, et cetera. And, and, and genetic counselors then create maps like this that basically show a fan, family lineage and so forth and uh, kind of used to estimate the chance of having a genetic uh, finding of sorts. 
And it turns out that there are multiple paths for genetic testing in prostate cancer. One is risk-driven, basically trying to estimate what the risk somebody has of developing prostate cancer. So what is your risk of developing cancer? What is your family's risk of developing cancer? How do we manage that risk? And that's where genetic counselors are quite helpful. And one is a treatment-driven uh, path where for patients who do have cancer, can we test them to see whether they are an exciting candidate or a candidate for exciting new therapy and so forth. And again, there are different objectives for genetic testing. I talked about somatic testing, which is testing the tumor, which basically looks at the mutation status of multiple genes within a tumor sample. <laughs> These tests aren't quite standardized yet, um, but they're mostly focused on treatment, like how we should treat the treatment, how, how we should treat the patient, and the potential uh, hereditability implications. Then there's also germline testing, um, where we usually look at single genes or just a couple's genes. This is more standardized, and this is kind of in the context of uh, hereditary risk and so forth. So it turns out that current assays are typically intended for somatic or germline uh, uh, alterations, to at least to assess for those, but not for both. And so it's important to understand the tests that you get, what they cover and their limitations, and your physician can help you do that. Some commercial tests will report these quote unquote secondary germline mutations that, that, that we're not sure whether they're clinically relevant at all or not. And so it's important to know that as well. Um, I wanna talk about the concept of cascade testing. Um, again, for, the, for patients who uh, have inherited DNA repair alterations, it turns out that siblings and children have a 50-50 chance of inheriting the same mutation, so this has importance beyond just the patient. And so here are the recommendations that, that, that we could consider for germline genetic testing for prostate cancer. And the recommendations continue to evolve. This is not a precise science, but in general, germline genetic testing should be offered to patients with metastatic prostate cancer with known mutation in a cancer susceptibility gene within the family, with a ha family history suggestive of hereditary prostate cancer, uh, or patients who have cancers uh, with alterations in these genes. And now we're starting to think about patients with high-risk localized disease with strong family histories uh, or those that are, are very, very young at the time of diagnosis. And so in summary, tumor and germline testing are distinct but complementary. They're important to help patients, uh, it's important for physicians to help patients understand the difference. Oncology providers are starting to recognize the importance of referrals to genetics and doing basic pretest counseling and referrals to genetic counselors should be considered in patients with a strong family history of cancer. I'd like to thank you for your time. I'm glad to take any questions. Thank you, Felix. So we've got uh, time for a few questions. Uh, if you can pass your cards, that's probably good, a good way to do it because we can quick screen them. Let me ask you a couple of questions to start with, Felix. Um, if, if I'm a patient with prostate cancer, how, how do I, di how, A, should I be tested? And how do I distinguish between germline and somatic mutations for the average patient? You, you, you indicated where they come from, but how do you tell, tell them apart in an individual patient? Um, and so first, uh, I think that as a patient, you should work with your physician because I gave a 15 minute talk, but there's a lot of complexity in this. And uh, you know, I, I think that and actually some providers in the community aren't necessarily familiar with all the differences either. And so come see a specialist and, and we'll help you walk through it. To be honest with you, about a quarter of my consultations nowadays have not, I'm a radiation oncologist, have nothing to do with radiation. It's more, hey, help me understand the, the genetics of my cancer. Secondly, in terms of tests, again, um, if we look at blood or, or saliva, um, meaning non-cancer tissue, that's how we look for germline uh, mutations. Uh, looking at the cancer itself allows you to look for somatic mutations. One has hereditary uh, implications, the other does not. Um, and so that's, that's something to think about. Good. Um, Felix, is genetic testing helpful in the treatment of prostate cancer? If so, at what stage and what type of testing will be helpful? Yes, uh, it's, it's definitely helpful in the context of metastatic prostate cancer, and Eric and Rahul will, touch, uh, will discuss that extensively this afternoon, so I'm not gonna answer that directly right now. And it's also useful in identifying patients with localized prostate cancer who has more aggressive disease versus who has less aggressive disease. Uh, Peter, uh, Carol, Matt Cooperberg, and I have made our careers on trying to come up with these so-called biomarkers to better personalize therapy for patients with localized disease, and we'll talk about that later as well. Right. 
there's a couple of questions here, uh, Felix, that, that speak to um, non-prostate cancers being associated in families of prostate cancers. One specific question about um, melanoma, another question about are you suggesting that genetic genomic testing for cancers other than prostate cancer? Uh, yes, I mean, I think that uh, what we look at is we look at patients with a strong family history of cancers. So, for example, if you had three relatives with cancer and two of them occurred, uh, you know, under the age of 40 or, or you know, or, 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 or so forth, um, then we start thinking about these, these germline mutations. And again, we're talking today in the context of prostate cancer, but these BRCA genes, not only do they predispose men to prostate cancer, they predispose women to breast cancer, ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, et cetera. And so this isn't necessarily specific to prostate cancer, but prostate cancer being so common, they often manifest in this context. So um, for every man in this room who has prostate cancer, so should each one of those men undergo germline testing? So germline testing, just to make it clear to everyone, is in every cell of your body. The testing, Felix showed it, is very easy. You spit into a tube or you give a tube of blood. It's very simple. The answer is no. <laughs> I, Eric is asking this because he's thinking that I'm going to send, uh, you know, I'm going to result in all 300 of you running and getting germline <laughs> testing. Please do not do that, okay? So um, it turns out that the chances of having one of these germline mutations if you have localized prostate cancer is actually very, very low. It's only if you have metastatic prostate cancer that you start having a 10% chance of having this. Um, you know, for patients who do not have metastatic prostate, so, so patients with metastatic prostate cancer, I personally favor getting some kind of genomic testing. Patients who do not have metastatic prostate cancer, who have localized prostate cancer, you know, I would think about uh, getting some kind of genetic testing if they're young. If I see a 40-year-old patient, I'll think about it. Or if they tell me, hey, you know, the five uh, male relatives on my side of the family each had it at, you know, age 40 to 50, then I'll think about it as well. Um, but again, it needs to be a discussion between the physician and the patient, uh, understanding the implications of getting testing. Or, uh, or people who don't have prostate cancer and who say, hey, you know, every, patient, every, every family member of mine had cancer uh, when they were young, um, then I would start thinking about that as well. So uh, for, on the medical oncology side, for patients with metastatic disease, because 10 to 12 percent of those patients will have one of these germline mutations, we reflexively will recommend germline testing for all of those patients, for those common mutations that, pe that Felix spoke about, and it's a simple panel. We believe there's three reasons to do it. The first is, if you have one of those germline mutations, then that puts you at risk for all those other cancers associated with it as an individual patient. Pancreatic cancer, male breast cancer, um, ovarian cancer, you probably, as a male, you probably won't get it. Uh, and melanoma, someone asked a question about. Those are those cancers that are very commonly associated in that syndrome. So that's one reason to do it, it just puts you at risk for those. The second reason to do it is that, and there was a question about this, does this affect your therapy down the line? And the answer to that is absolutely yes, and Dr. Agarwal will be speaking to that later. And then the third, of course, is family history. Um, so important, again, I hope uh, people have gotten the distinction between germline testing, which is heritable cancer, check blood, check uh, cheek swab, spit into a tube, versus somatic testing, which is testing of genetic mutations in the cancer. Um, because those tend to come later, and as Dr. Agarwal will describe, do affect therapy. Okay. Um, Felix, does treatment, uh, this is a good one for a cool way, but does treatment itself lead to further genetic mutations? <laughs> um, I think that, you know, for the vast, vast, vast majority of patients, the answer is no. Um, but it turns out that sometimes if you're on a particular drug, uh, the cancer can pick up a mutation that makes it resistant to that treatment. Um, it's not that the treatment caused that particular uh, uh, mutation. It's just that cancer cells are really smart and they have to figure out ways to uh, 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 evade various treatments and sometimes the mutations help them do that. Um, that being said, you know, uh, treatments like radiation and chemotherapy have been known to be associated with a small risk of a secondary cancer 
that risk is about two in a thousand, 10 years down the road. And so when I counsel patients for radiation, I tell them that that risk is possible. But I also tell them we gotta treat the cancer that they have, not worry about the two in a thousand chance of developing that second cancer 10 years later. Great, thank you, Dr. Frank. Thank you.